Hey guys, welcome to the Dragon's Voice Podcast. I am your host, Truly Reese Deans, and thank you so much for continuing to support the Dragon's Voice Podcast or the Dragon's Voice channel. And we've got more content for you, and I hope you enjoyed the last few uh, episodes along with Stuart Fleetwood. Uh, and uh, we've got some more coming up in the future. And sometimes I can't really think at the top of my head who I've had on. I've had so many guests on the show, it's unbelievable. But we're going to keep carrying on, we're going to continue. And I think this uh, episode now we're coming into February. So I hope your February is good and ho- hopefully you're staying safe. But we'll continue on and carry on as normal. And right now we've got another guest here on the podcast, uh, former Coventry Burton. I mean, like the list goes on, but he has had a call up for Wales as well. And we're going to talk all about it. And it's none other than Lee Fowler. Lee, how's it going, buddy? Yeah, I'm not too bad, mate. A little bit bored, but um, <laughs> stuck it in there with uh, obviously COVID and that. So, but um, I'm good on a whole, mate. And uh, you're, you're manager of uh, Rad- Radcliffe Town, is that right? Uh, not Radcliffe, that Radcliffe FC, is that right? Um, yeah. It is. So, where are Radcliffe at the moment then? Where are they positioned in the league system? Uh, we're in step three, so just below the Conference National North and South. Um, it's a good club. It's, I think it's grown massively over the last sort of five or six years. Um, I think it's gone from 70 fans up to 400, 500. Um, and they just keep getting better and better. And the infrastructure of the football club is massive. Um, and they want to get it promoted into the, into the next level. So... You know, they're serious people, and that's why I chose to go in there. And uh, we're going to go um, to talk about more about your manager career uh, in a moment. But right now, let's talk about your playing career. So you started at uh, Coventry City at the time where Coventry were in the uh, in the Premier League. So can you tell us how how you went from, you know, you're a Cardiff lad, you're a Cardiff boy. Yeah. But how did you go yeah. from um, getting the, uh, the, the call to come and play for Coventry City? Um, well, as, as you said, we you play for Cardiff schools, Cardiff City, Cardiff uh, the districts, and stuff like that. And at the time when I was coming through, it was my mum and dad had my mum had a meeting with um, I can't remember the chairman. Who's the chairman's name? The old chairman of Cardiff City. Uh, Years oh, ago, in that. Oh, is that uh, before Sam? Sam in right, or was it Sam Hamal? Before right. Before, oh, right. before them. Before um, them oh, I can't remember. That, that's when I don't know. I think the only I know it was Richard. Something right around that time, but I, I can't really remember. I think it was probably yeah. Sam. Well, it was before Sam it was, because Sam signed me the second time when I came to Cardiff. But they had a, um, a meeting with my mum, say, asking why, obviously, all the Cardiff boys were leaving the town to go and sign for, like, you know, my brother signed for Palace, Lee Kendall signed for Palace, Matthew Bibby signed for Cardiff, um, Kyle Shepherd went somewhere, you know, I went somewhere, Pipey went to Coventry. Card- uh, Coventry. Um, and well, I just I was trialing around a load of different clubs, and um, obviously with my brother being a football player, I knew really that uh, I was like that with rugby and football. You know what I mean? I was like, it got to a point where my mum said, "Listen, you're not doing great at school. You need to knuckle down on one or the other." Uh, I chose football. Uh, Coventry went to play a game up in the valley somewhere against, I think it was uh, Cumbran or something like that. So I went up, went and played them, done well, and they offered to sign me, and I just got a good vibe about it. Um, it wasn't too far away from home. It was in London for the bright lights. So my brother had been uh, sucking too in terms of uh, the nightclubs and the gambling and the, that sort of stuff. So I thought it would be a good move for me. And that's why I went there. And you were under uh, Gordon Strachan for the first uh, few, few years when you got into the first team. So what was he like as a manager? And what was he like just to be in the presence of him? Because he was, you know, he's a former, uh, former Man United player uh, and everything. So what was it like to be around him? Um, to be honest with you, I li- it's quite weird, really. I lived with his son for six months when I got older. We, we you know, we lived in a lodge of 28 lads, Irish, Scottish, Welsh, Italian, Swedish. Um, and initially, I, I thought him, I found him quite a bully, to be honest with you, in terms of most Scottish people back then, the managers were authoritative and disciplinary. And um, he was very quick, very sharp. His fitness regime was unbelievable at Coventry. Um, he was probably still the fittest and best player when he was a manager. Um, so that was a good learning thing for him. But, um, you know, I, I was very young, very naive, very opinionated, even at 15, you know, when I was on the bench in Newcastle and didn't get on. Most 15-year-olds would have would have said, you know, brilliant achievements. And I'm there, I'm there saying I should have got on. Um, and then when I didn't travel the next week, I was like, well, you know, why am I playing? Um, and I, I don't. I think he liked it, and I think he hated it at the same breath. It was like 
but it's great, but you're only 15 or 16, you, you know, you shouldn't be saying these things, but ultimately I had that much sort of belief in my ability that I thought I'd ask the questions. Um, when you, during your time at Coventry City, you know, they they're in the Premier League and then slowly, I think they got relegated to, to the, uh, the championship or what was it called now? The first division uh, as it was yeah. the first second division. I get confused sometimes when it comes to division. They just rename things left, right and centre. I go, yeah. what? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but when that happened and because uh, Gordon Strachan left the club, uh, I think he got sacked or something and a new manager came in. Well, who was the new manager that, that came in and and what changed for you when that new manager came in? Um, to be honest with you, I... I, I, when they got relegated, um, we, we there was a lot of big wages that included myself. All the youngsters who had played or broke in had, were really rewarded. And then when um, Gary McAllister came in, you know, it was near enough to talk that all the big earners had to be set. We were separated from the training ground. There was like 14 or 15 of us who had to train alone. And it was quite disheartening, really. Um, it was the first real time you've you've been treated like a piece of meat, you know what I mean? Because of the wages you were on or a contract you signed. Um, so that was that. Um, and then obviously when Roland Nielsen was there, he was the one who sort of, he was the one who, who, he had to play me in the end because I was scoring goals regularly for the youth team and the reserves. And, you know, he, he didn't want to hold me back anymore. And then he was the one who sort of got me in. And at the time as well, during your time at Coventry, you know, you 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 were playing for Wales, you know, the under 20 went or any of the... Uh... You know the the squads in Wales, and then you got a call up. Uh, although you didn't, you know, you were on the bench, but you didn't make an appearance. But you know, it was still a, a probably a, an achievement for you. You know, a big honour just to be called up to, to come and represent Wales. Um, how, how did you find out that uh, uh, you were going to go off and uh, be part of the Wales squad? Um, I think the first, initially the first thing I was always injured for Wales. I didn't really like enjoy going away with Wales, um, particularly. Uh, we always used to seem to travel to like the places where, you know, it wasn't great. You know, the Azerbaijan's or you, you know, we're traveling through on long bus journeys. The travel was poor. The, the, certainly, the style of football was horrendous um, under the tenure of uh, Jimmy Shoulder, um, and it was embarrassing really. I think I think the age group where we evolved in, I think it was one win in five years, and that was against Azerbaijan at home. I think they won one nil. Um, and, and it used to be, it's, it, I used to hate going away with Wales. Um, you know, it's changed, obviously, speed and, and um, Cookie and uh, Mark Hughes changed a little bit. But, you know, when we were growing up, it was, uh, you, no disrespect to the, the Welsh Premier Leagues, but, you know, I've been playing in the Premier League or being trained with Premier League football players. And all of a sudden you're playing with lads from Bangor or Real or wh- whatever it may have been. And now we all know the Welsh Premier League, what it is now. Well, what it, it wasn't what it was when I was 16, 17, um, you know, it's much more professional now. You've got much better players. They're full time. They look after themselves. But I don't know if you remember, and we had Les Davis at one point. And this was the Les Davis who was six foot three, 17 stone, uh, playing for Banger at the time. And it just used to frustrate me. But it, it was ironic because I missed the first two years for injury of the 21s. I didn't play any games. Um, and then I got a call up for the Argentina game. And it was down to Bellas and Hearts. They obviously at Coventry with me. There was a massive injury, sort of um, an injury in that camp. And Mark Hughes asked them both, do you know any lads who are Welsh and who's attacking? And they, they both put me forward. And, you know, ironically, I missed the, the fax. The fax fell down the back of the machine. And I missed two days of the actual um, the training camp, as it was. And I turned up on the, I think it was the day before the game, I turned up for Argentina. Um, and then the game, I got called up for Croatia. Again, the facts didn't come through. And I and sort of, I don't know if they held that against me because it happened a few times, but it had nothing to do with me. Like, that, you know, it was after the camp had finished, I was told I was called up for the number two, two in, full internationals. And, you know, I may have got my full full debut. I don't know. Um, at the time, you know, you mentioned uh, Craig Bellamy because he played for uh, Coventry at the time as well, I think, uh, yeah, yeah. in his early stages, you know, and uh, what was that like, you know, to be around, uh, to be around with uh, Craig Bellamy at the time? I mean, a, a huge character for Wales and probably for a majority yeah. of the majority of the clubs. Yeah, well, well he, knew, he knew my family anyway from, from Rumney, um, St. Melons, so he knew my cousin, who, who obviously no longer here anymore, who was a good mate of his. 
So it was quite easy for me to, you know, I think a lot of players are quite shocked that me and Bella's had quite a good bond anyway, but we were from the same, you know, card from the same neck of the woods and we knew the same people. He, you know, my cousin had looked after him a few times and um, and it was perfect. But when he came in, he was, <clears throat> he knew, we knew he wasn't staying. It was a stopgap to get to where he needed to get to. And I'm, I never, I remember his first day where he came in and he said, right, I'm off to Newcastle next year. And we, everybody was like, you know, the stories about Bella's and, his mouth and how he can talk himself into trouble, get locked in toilets at Norwich when he was 16. And he'd done it from day one. And to be honest, you, as soon as the season finished, he signed for Newcastle that the next summer in 12 months. So everything he said was right. But his professionalism mate, and his work rate and his ability was is scary. Like, no one can ever question that. You just got to look what he did when he went to City. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the way he did it as well, you know, and uh, whatever he said, you know, he would do it. You know, he's... Oh, yeah. uh, pretty straightforward kind of guy, you know, and, uh, but it's just that, it was just that thing, you know, where, where, I mean, recently, you know, with Mick McCarthy being hired as the Cardiff City manager, um, a lot of people expected, you know, at, at least, you know, maybe Craig Benley could have been the one to, you know, lead Cardiff City. Do you think in, in his position, do you think he would have done that? Do you think he would have been capable of, of getting yeah. some of with Cardiff without a doubt? hundred percent. He, he... He's, as I said to you before, I've known Bella since he was at Norwich with my brother as a kid, and he's always studied the game. So it's, never, it's not just about, you know, you look at Frank Lampard now, he's been at Derby for a year, gone to Chelsea, uh, been sacked, and everybody's saying, oh, it's because he's got no experience. Well, Bella has been studying football since he was 15, 16 on himself privately. He used to fly out, it's well written, that he used to fly out to Ajax and watch him train within his sort of footballing career. You know, he's done the youth team um, at Cardiff City. He's done the analyst on the sky. He's done his licenses. He's now working with Belgium, I believe, is he? Um, is he with Martinez at Belgium? Or, oh, no, uh, it, it was Anderlecht. Anderlecht, yeah, I think. Anderlecht, yeah, with the centre-half to play for Man City. And I think it, it's sort of a bug burner for me because as a manager, you see these managers who are constantly sort of getting managers' jobs because of their name. And why not? Why, why you know, Mick McCarthy has got no... Um, empathy towards that football club, um, no sort of history with it, good or bad. And then you look at Bellas and you think, well, he done well when he was there as a player. He's, he, has, he loves the club. He knows the club from the youth structure all the way through. Um, obviously, I don't know if the owners are still there for Cardiff. The um, the Tans, was it or yeah, yeah. the names, the owners? But is it because of what happened with the? the allegations regarding, you know, some of the stuff he was saying to the youth team players, which you don't you don't know. But for me, I would have given it to I would have given it to Bellas. Um I think he talks good. He he knows his football. He loves the club. And for me, he cares. So that's that's gonna be me more from him. But yeah, again another manager's back on the roundabout, same as Sam Allardyce is your Steve Bruce is they always seem to get another chance or another chance and another chance. And it's and it's, it's all the way down the pyramid. It's, it's, it's very bizarre as a manager, a young manager coming through. It's very bizarre to see. So speaking of managers, you know, I think we're going to jump forward quite a bit where you signed for Burton Albion. It was under Nigel Clough. Now, uh, obviously, it, it's in his name, it's Clough, you know, the son of Brian Clough, you know. But uh, I, I was watching a few documentaries um, that involve with Brian Clough, obviously. But every time they mention Nigel, that uh, when he when he went to Derby, you know, a lot of his family members and some of the players are under Burton Albion, and I was going to ask you the same thing, you know, he had sort of the same, same, um, probably style, tactic, or probably same, had a bit of an influence, you know, a bit of a toughness, because that's what his father was, you know, and it, and it goes without saying, but when, when you signed for Burton and you were playing under an idol club, what was that like for you? It was quite... It... Now I'm a manager, I can see why he does what he does. But it'll only last for so long, in my, in my personal opinion. Um, as I said, he's quite, he's quite unique in terms of he's eccentric like his dad. Um, training, I remember one training session, uh, we, we, we used to, if we won on a Saturday, we'd be off on a Monday. Training Tuesday, off on a Wednesday. Training Thursday, we wouldn't do set pieces on a Friday, so we'd be off on Friday, so there's no point. But it's one day we went and played cricket indoors. And um, you know, that's how the random things he would do. He'd do cricket, he would do gymnastics, he would do athletics. He would just keep changing up that. And you'd be thinking, like, it's fun, but what are you doing? Like, and 
I remember I used to play cricket with my dad's cricket team up in Barry to knew it. So I, I could play cricket like, a, you know, I was more of a field than a bat, but played baseball as well, which you know, Carl is good as well. But we play for Wales, me and Mike and Curtis actually play for Wales as well. I watched Curtis as well yesterday. Um, and I kept hitting him all over the place. But, and he sent me home because I didn't put my bat in the crease. And he was, I was like, well, that's just like messing around. He was like, no, this is like, this is serious like this. You've got to play this game properly. And I'm like, we're in an indoor cricket thing. And he's, but he, 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 was, he was relentless and stuff that it does. But um, I think he's another one who's, who's probably living off his dad's name. And, you know, he's been at Sheffield United. He's been to Derby, failed. He didn't do it at Sheffield United. You know, I know he was at Burton. And then he sort of, um, they got promoted just after he left. You know, Roy McFarlane come in and, and seen it off. But I don't know. I just, I, I, I watched him the other day. That he's at Mansfield now. And I watched his... Um, you know, he's probably waiting for the forest job, if I'm being honest with you, to finish off the whole Derby, Derby way or that Clough way, whatever they're going to call it, Derby Forest. And, and uh, I don't know, mate. Yeah, but he's good. He, you know, he's very, he looks after the lads, he rewards them. He gives them money to go and have a drink, gives you days off. Um, if there's something that needs to be said, he will say it. Lack, not really much coaching. It's very simplistic, simple in terms of pass and move to touch. That's all we got to pass and move to touch. Yeah. Uh, you went on loan to Scarborough at one point, you know, and I think there was a, uh, there was a consideration that you were going to be a signing firm on a, on a permanent basis. I mean, it, it did say when I was researching now, and I, I don't know, but uh, yeah, there was, um, but there, there was a financial uh, dilemma. There was a financial crisis going on in the club. So um, when you first went there on loan, did you knew straight away as soon as you walked into the to the stadium or to the club that you knew, nah, I'm not going to be staying there for long because of what was going to ha- what was happening? No, it was quite weird, really, because I still had a year and a half left on my contract at Huddersfield, and it was very rare for a player to drop down from the league. I just won promotion to League One. <clears throat> I dropped down from League One. I went on loan just to get some games to get fit. I didn't care what level it was. I just wanted to play games. But then it offered me a two year deal on something like sixteen hundred quid a week sign on fee. Uh, free accommodation, petrol, all, all the the bits and bobs. And by the time I got my payoff from Huddersfield and the money they were going to pay me, I was better off by, by a lot, considerable lot of money. Um, and we were down the bottom. We were, we were sort of, you could see there was something going wrong because the wages were being paid in like, you know, I remember one game I was paid from the bandit, you know, like the pounds. Um, and obviously when we got relegated, I, my contract was a contracted so I, regardless of what happened I could have put the club under a lot quicker um, and I remember his name was Reynolds I think Malcolm Reynolds was the chairman at the time uh, Neil Redfern I was like right I'm owed two years which is a lot of money if you pay me this amount today I'll leave now or otherwise the club's going to go bust today um, they paid me what they owed me and, and I just walked and then that's what I went for Scarborough to Burton and, but um, yeah it was sad to see but you know they're in, obviously in my league now and you know, I was captain at Scarborough as well when they got relegated. So it was a bit, it was, I, you know, I wasn't really concentrating properly off the field and, and I didn't really take it properly at that time because I had a few issues and stuff. But it's a good club, mate. And, you know, I've got no doubt they'll get back to the, the least the conference in all, I think. And uh, speaking of, you know, the chairmen's and, uh, you know, difficulties and everything, you, you know, when you went to Kettering Town, you know, you had uh, um, probably a, uh, I, what I say, like a not the best relationship with the I don't know if it was the chairman or the chairman slash owner of Kettering Town. Yeah, yeah. So what, what what happened? What what was the reason behind you know that this situation? Well, again, I was so I was at Forest Green with Curtis. We were flying, and you know I turned down loads of clubs from the league. I, you know I had a good season, um, and I decided to sign for Kettering. Um, it was a completely different style, very long ball, very second balls, um, completely against how I play football. I'm more of a purist and get a ball on the floor, keep playing through me. So I just thought I needed a change from my own development. Um, I got to Kettering and I, I've, I hear, I've heard the rumours about what he'd done, the chairman, and I'm, I'm thinking, if, as long as he doesn't do it to me, I don't really care, to be honest with you. Uh, but then... Slowly before leading up to the FA Cup game, he was ringing Mark Cooper up, telling him, if you play him and play him, I'll put the rest of the... It was mostly the, the black players, really. They wanted him on, on the transfer list. So he had Nick Books, um, Exodus Gahegan, JP Mana, 
uh, there was quite it was, it was a majority of the people that he enjoyed watching. Um, and then as soon as a couple of other players played, he would kick off the chairman. So that was the first time I knew there was a little bit of interaction between the chairman uh, trying to guide the manager who to play, when to play, how to play. So I was like, well, I ain't having this. Like, if he ever says anything to this to me, just let me know when I'll go and see him. Blah, 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 blah. So Mark Cooper got the job at Peterborough. Um, I, I, I always sign for a manager. I don't sign for the club. I sign for a manager. So my first thing is, if I've got a good connection with that manager, I'll play for you. Then the bad you know, becomes second because I need to know that I'm playing for the right person. The club will always be right, but you have to play for the right person. Um, that was that. Listen, I said, right, I've got a three-year deal. I'm, I'm on really good money. Um, just take my money. I don't want it. You know, I did my contract because I was traveling up from Cardiff. I had Mondays off. Um, and and it, all of a sudden, little things started becoming a problem, um, which were agreed by him. Me and Imran agreed the contract together. No agents, no solicitors. Me and Imran in the room. This is your wages. This is your sign-on fee. This is your day off in your contract. This is the hotel paid for, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then it come to the FA Cup game. So I said to him, you know, I knew Oxford wanted to sign me with Chris Wilder was there. I said, take your money. I don't want it. I'm off. Uh, but then we played Leeds in the fourth round of the FA Cup. Uh, and there was a massive injury crisis. So I had to be on the bench. I, I, couldn't, I could not not be on the bench. There was only like 13 players. And two of them were, were, one of them was a goalkeeper and it was me, the only one. Uh, as it happened, somebody gets injured in uh, normal time. Sorry, extra time. I come on in extra time. It was nil-nil. We lost 5-1. So what he done is he sacked me and he sacked, um, sorry, he sacked the assistant manager for bringing me on. So I went outside and said, listen, do you want to come outside and have a conversation? His mind just sort of stepped in. It was a little scuffle. And then he was abusing me on, um, I think it was talk sport he was abusing me on and he was abusing me on um, he was abusing me on something else um, which was naughty so I had to ring up the show um, and just explain myself really what was going on um, which was not great so yeah so we talked up to and I talk, it, it was a fact it was Darren Rack the captain who was at uh, Kettering at the time He'd rang me up and said, listen, I think you need to watch, listen to this interview. Like, you, you're getting abused. It was Darren Goff and I can't remember the other presenter. So, uh, obviously, I'd listen to what he's saying. It was all nonsense, all, you know. So, I just rang up and said, listen, we're just going to apologise for, you know, the behaviour of the chairman. Um, I think it's got to a point now where it's, it's, it's demeaning and uh, derogative and it actually could be sued for being liable, really, because what he's saying is actually untrue. And, you know, I've got proof. I'm sorry I've had to come on and defend myself, but I've had to defend my name and my family's name because now I'm being accused of something which I haven't been done. Um, and it was the fact that he, he wasn't an agent, it wasn't the manager, it was me and him who sat down in the room and he knew all my money, all my wages, all my anything we agreed with, he was there. He was the one who said, yes, tick, you can have it, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then later, about two minutes later, I rang him and said, right, this is the last time you saw, you say something like that publicly or I'll sue you for the def like character, definition of character or something. I don't think yeah, defamation of character, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. So obviously, my, I didn't have an agent. I had a solicitor. I'd, I'd always had a solicitor as an agent, so it was pretty easy to do. And he soon backtracked. And as I said, I found out the other day he's bankrupt now with no money, so <laughs> brilliant. Yeah. So you just have to be, be back, we'll ask go, ah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, as I said, I'm a firm believer in karma. If you're good to people, they'll be good back to you. Yeah. Um, and he, I think he was on the run as well. I think he was on the run from the old bill. Um, <laughs> and I was just sitting there, like, I would eat my popcorn as you do the emoji, thinking, oh, happy days. Like, yeah. That's, that's him, mate. That's, that's, that's the type of person he is. And you only have to look at the clubs he'd been involved with or actually Google his name to realise that it, I wasn't the first and I certainly wouldn't have been the last in football. Yeah, that was, um, it was, it, funny enough, you know, it kind of reminds me of um, the, the Vaughan family that owned uh, Chester and uh, they owned Bangor at one point, you know, and uh, I think another football club as well, I can't really remember. And you just think to yourself, how, you know, how, how do they get away with it, you know, uh, owning or trying to get involved with these football clubs? And then next, you know, it's, you knew it's going to end badly. And you just think to yourself, or you question yourself, it goes, how can this, you know, carry on or go through it you know so yeah, they, tried, they tried to sign me they had a Malta club didn't they they had a team over in Malta yeah 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 they tried to sign me and he'd rung me up and said oh, you know come over 
um, you know, we'll only pay you. And I'm thinking, I've, I, obviously, I don't know. I don't know the stories. Everybody reads in what it is. But I was like, no. And I went and met him when he went to Bangor the second time when Nev Powell was the manager. Um, I turned up with Gary Hours. I don't know if you remember Gary Hours. Yeah, um, yeah. They were they were there involved, and they wanted me to come in as player manager. And I was I was like, no, I don't know, I don't know if I can do this. Like, because obviously with with footballers, you need the money. You know, it's your wages. Um, you know, even even a month's delay on wages or a week's wages can really affect, like you know, normal people. And um, and that's why I didn't sign it in the end. But yeah, it is uh, the character, shall we say? Yeah, it's a bit of a madness going on there. And so when so where did you go after Kettering Town then? So what, what was the next step for you? Was it because you did go to Oxford and I that was on a loan, but I don't know if that was after around Kettering Town. Oh, yeah, yeah. That so it was a bit it was a bit a bit crazy really. So I had a few clubs come in for me, Wrexham. Um, there was another couple of clubs, but for some reason Oxford's a massive club, isn't it? Um, obviously didn't do my research in terms of the manager, Chris Wilder. Um, I left there and agreed to deal with Oxford. They were top of the league. I'm thinking, right, great, big stadium, big fan base, re engage my mind to get back playing the football league, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I, it was horrendous weather. I, the weather was like ridiculous. It was like the worst snow we've had for, for so many years. And what we did is we trained in an indoor barn from, uh, it was in Milton Keynes. So I used to cross over the bridge from Cardiff meet um, Brian Clark, the goalkeeper in Bath, Junction 17, I think it was, and then we'd drive across to Milton Keynes. Now, this Milton Keynes indoor barn was like really condensed. It wasn't big and I was on fire and I'm thinking, this is all this, you know what I mean? I'm thinking, great. The weather changed and I don't know if you've seen Oxford's pitch. It's massive. Oh, yeah. Now, yeah, now I can run. I can, I can run in a game, not a problem, but when it comes to physical running, in my mind, something happens and I go, this is just punishment. Like, it's not. But Chris Wilde is, is fanatic about his fitness, like, which is, that's why he's done so good. He's ruthless. And uh, the goalkeepers were lapping me in the runs and I was like, the chairman, and they were like, who's this lad here? Like? Um, and then Andy Mel was going, oh, we're going to get you back into the Premier League, the Championship. And then two runs later, he's like, fouls, you're going to have to get rid of your mates. You can't run. But I played, I only played one game from Mad Man of the Match in the FA Trophy. We beat Woking 1-0. Um, and I just wanted to play games. Um, I could have gone to another club in the conference. I think it might have been Forest Green because I've already signed for Kettering and Oxford. I couldn't sign for another proper club. So I went to Sirencester for one game, quickly realised that level's not for me, um, couldn't do it. And then I was ready to just call it a day to the summer. And then a guy called Matt Clark, who was the manager of Hales Owen Town, he rung me up. He said, "Right, we'll pay you, pay you, pay your petrol to come up from Cardiff. Uh, they're playing in step three or four. We had Stefan Moore. Um, I think there's about five Premier League ex Premier League players playing there. And like we were winning games like eight 0 They had a fifteen point deduction on them, and we ended up finishing like we scored thirty nine goals in like seven games. It was, I really enjoyed it. Like it was, I, it was just it was just a good good guy, and, he, and he's one of my closest mates now. I've kept in touch with him for so long. So, um, yeah, that's where I went after them." Do you know when you went to Wrexham, you went on two different occasions, you know, there was a bit of a bit, bit of a gap, you know, because you went to various clubs before you had your sex spouse. But during your time at Wrexham, was there ever, you know, a time where you were going to be comfortable at Wrexham to be staying there for a few years, uh, even though you had two, set, uh, two spells there? Um, what was your time at Wrexham like? And did you ever feel like that you were going to be staying there a long, uh, pretty longer than you thought you were going to be staying there for? Yeah, well, as I said, I, I um, you know, I was up far on the screen with Curtis and my brother and Dave Hockaday, and I, I was having a few issues off the field, which led me to go into rehab. And um, I'd come out and I was single-handedly, in my opinion, carrying that Forest Green team, uh, and I was on three hundred quid. And I, as I said, he's never one of my mates now, Reece Stice. He's, um, I used to call he was an extra plumber, and he was on seven fifty a week. So like I'm, I think I set up to like 12, 13 goals and Forest Green were playing good football. And I was on this little money non-contract and this plumber was on 750. And and I and I went in, I went, listen, Dave, what's going on? I said, I'm not being funny, mate, but you know, I'm pulling trees up here and I'm on peanuts, really. And this kid's a plumber and he's on 750 a week. And me and Reese laughed, and we're close, mate. You know what I mean? And we 
you know, close mates, but he's obviously at the beginning you're thinking, you know, I'm not a plumber, I'm a football player. Um, so when I, I had a big injury on my knee, come back and I just said, right, if you ain't going to give me a contract, I'm going to sign for these two clubs. Wrexham was the other one. Dean Saunders rang me, bought into everything he said, um, got me trim, got me fit. I stopped drinking, uh, met my, my, my fiance. Um, yeah, it, I was in a good place. I was like, no one could touch me. Um, I, I was back to the Leaf Owl that I was in a, probably in the Premier League version um, with my mindset, my body. Uh, and, I, and I stayed there for this again. I was on peanuts. I slept on a, I slept on a floor. Um, I dislocated my elbow, cut the cast off after one day just to keep playing. I split my leg open with, um, I needed 13 stitches. I had an injection, just kept playing and playing and playing and all these things. And then in the summer, uh, Dean was going to stay. I had loads of clubs wanting to sign me from the Championship League, one down. Uh, I went and met a few of them, but I always knew I wanted to stay with Dean Saunders. Um, and then, <clears throat> obviously, Dean got the... the was it a Doncaster? Yeah, Dean got the Doncaster job. Um, but within that period of time as well, my brother-in-law died. He was like 19. Um, he left a young baby. Uh, obviously, the debt I was in previously going to there was catching up on me. Um, and obviously, they had a young kid as well. I just My missus was just pregnant as well. And then all of a sudden, I had this Dean leaving, my brother-in-law passing away. Um, and then all of a sudden, I thought, I need to secure my family. Uh, and Dean, Dean offered 10 grand to buy me to go to Doncaster in the championship. But it just felt wrong. I think it's because he was signing Chimbonda uh, and Alex Juf. Uh, he signed a lot of big, big names. And if I'm coming in off the back of these big names, um, then the, the fans were going to come for me, which they did do anyway, Doncaster. I'll talk about this later on. I went in, I think they voted by the worst players ever played for him. So me and James Harper. So. Uh, yeah, so me and but I didn't. I only played that like I'd go into the Doncaster bit a bit, but Fleetwood offered me a, a really good contract with a sign on fee. Um, you know, I knew my best mate was there, the chairman kept ringing me and showing me the affection. And I ended up going there really. And it, I didn't really enjoy the club, but I just enjoyed winning and um, the money really. That's the only time I've really gone for money. So your time at Doncaster, well, what? So you, you're saying you you were voted as the worst player or something? But well, so yeah. what? Well, I was um, I'll, I'll ask about Dean Saunders in a bit, but because yeah. now you mentioned Doncaster, I'm thinking, hmm, what? <laughs> so uh, yeah. what? What, what, well, was, what, what it was it? So I had gone, I I had a two year deal at Fleetwood, and the, the manager played me and Mickey Mellon at the time, and we'd won every game. And then he just dropped me from randomly for no reason. So I was like, right, I'm off. See you later. Blah, blah, blah. So I drive down to Doncaster. We agree the deal, do the deal. And so obviously I always carried weight as a player. I, I, always, had that, I always had that bit of weight. Like, and they had a player there called Richie Wellens, who was quite similar in style to me, similar in body stature. Obviously, he really went to Leicester, who played in the Premier League. Um, so... The day I signed, Dean Saunders got the Wolves job. So I was like, listen, whatever you do, don't not, please tell me Brian Flynn's not getting the job. He'd obviously chucked me out of the Welsh 21s. He didn't like me. I didn't like him. I didn't agree with him. I thought he was pre predated. He didn't have a clue about modern football, but he lived on the back of other people. stuff. So he's like, Dean's like, no, fouls, you'd be sound. He ain't coming in. So I play on a Saturday. It was nil-nil against Colchester. I come on, we win one nil. We play on Tuesday. Dean's obviously signed for Wolves now. So Dean's gone to Wolves on a Sunday. I get to the hotel for pre-match on the Tuesday. And then it's just me in the room with no one else. And who walks in? Brian Flynn. I'm like, oh my God. Like The one person he promised me wouldn't take over. So Brian's like, I leave, right? Do you know when it's uncomfortable, you don't like each other. So I was like, yeah, Brian, I'm sound, mate. He went, oh... Uh, did you play on the weekend? I was thinking, yeah, I come on and set up the goal like we won 1-0 against Colchester. He went, I'm going to keep the same team and the same and uh, the same bench. I was like, all right, sound, I'm on the bench. And he went, on. Oh. So he didn't listen to what I said anyway. And he was like, yeah, I was on the bench. He went, oh, you won't be on the bench, mate. You won't be playing. So that that to me straight away, mate, I was gone then. I was like, we. I lived in a hotel in Bawtree. I had an Italian there, Chinese. Uh, you when your head goes, your head goes. So I was literally just finishing training, straight in Italian, seven pints, pasta, pizza, back home, bed, same again, repeat, 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 repeat. And then 
uh, we played Crawley on TV and I put on about two stone. I was a disgrace. Like I was, I was so fat. It was a joke. Um, but I played in midfield with James Harper and we drew nil nil. And, and the fans were like, it, even my own mates, even Curtis, I think even Curtis McDonald hammered me about eating like I, I was fat. Like you can't get away from it. And uh, anyway, so that was that. And then we, they won the league. They won the league. I don't even remember. I, um, I agreed to pay up with Doncaster. I had a big, I had a big promotion fee with them. So I said, right, I'll take the pay up. I'm going to go Forest Green. Or Bur- I think I went to Burton. But obviously I want to keep my promotion bonus. So I was in a bar abroad. I don't know where it was. And there's when they missed the penalty one end and then Billy Painter ran down the other end, didn't he? And, and scored, the other, scored from the tapping and the rest is history. Got promoted. So I'm buzzing. Low, I've got a big sign on fee. I'm jumping around this bar abroad. And then I, even now, I still get it now. If you type in my name in, in like, it'll come up. Lee Fowler, worst set of midfielder that Doncaster's ever had. How did we sign for Doncaster? He must have been sleeping with, like, he must have had pictures of Dean Saunders doing stuff and all, all this. But it's like, in reality, when I first played for him, they were like, oh, this is the next Ricky Wellens. You know, because we won. Next Richie Wellens, you know, he's good. He's a good player. And then all of a sudden, I've gone for me and James Harper being the worst two players, which probably is nonsense because James Harper's a technically very good football player as well. Mm. Um, but every time they tweet me now, in fact, they don't actually tweet me. They tweet my name, but not actually me. But they won the league by one point. I played in three games, which cost us five points. So without me, they wouldn't have won the league. That's why I'm going to say to them, just to wind them up. But they, they hate me like this. But I just laugh. I just laugh like, it doesn't bother me. But... Oh, my phone just went from that stand. Um, one minute. I don't know who's on. Ah. One minute. Um, yeah, my mother in law is calling me, even though my missus is just right there. <laughs> um, did David, I, I don't know what year this was, it had to be, but uh, was it around about the time David Cottrell was there? Was David yeah, Cottrell was there, yeah. Yeah, because he's playing for Barry Town at the, at the moment, so uh, and he's doing wonders for us. So fair play. I mean, I was a bit shocked when, because I, I knew his cousin Jordan. You know, he's a he's a Barry Town regular. Yeah. You know, and he's, but when, um, but we didn't know um, that you know there was ever going to be a, a chance for David Cottrell to come out of retirement and come and play uh, yeah. for a team like Barry, and. <laughs> And we always had a joke about it because by the time we got back into the, the, the Welsh Premier League or the Cambridge Premier is now called, yeah. we'd always had the joke of, hey, George, go and go and tell your cousin to come and play for us. You know, and this is going to be amazing. And next, you know, uh, I don't think it was his part. It was the manager, Gavin Chesco's part. And the next, you know, bam, we just opened up. And we thought, what the hell's going on here? So, uh, um, but what was, but at, at that time, you know, what was uh, David Cotter like within the squad? You know, did you get along with him during yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, as I said, I, Barry, I used to watch Barry all the time because we, we used to own the pub, you know, the top of the hill, the Tinuid. Oh, yeah, the, the Tinuid pub, yeah. Yeah, well, my mum and dad owned that for like 15 years. So we used to climb over the back and watch. Like Darren Took was there. Um, what was the left footer name? He's captain. He's, I think he's the record goal scorer for him. But we used to climb over, me and my brother used to climb over the fence right at the top behind the stadium and watch him. We, like, we used to love it. Um, but yeah, uh, Cots was. Um, I got on with all every club I've been at. It's very rare that I've not got on with a player. Um, you know, I like to be the centre of attention in terms of having a joke and a laugh and um, just have a bit of banter. But Cots was really good. Um, obviously, because we're from the same neck of the woods, and he know quite a few of my mates from Ely and um, quite a few. But his his ability was unbelievable. Like I. I remember saying once his technique was better than Ronaldo's, like free kicks, and Beckham and I'm like somebody I don't know who it was. I don't know who it was. One of the players was like, Are "You sure?" And I was like, "Listen, I'm telling you, like, I've played football with Premier League players, and the way he does this free kick, it's like I've never seen anything like it." Um, but yeah, he he was funny, it, Dean, because obviously I had a good relationship with Dean, and it was him and Kyle Bennett who played for Doncaster who were like. He came in one game and both of them had a stinker, but both of them the best players, and he couldn't bring him off. And he was like, "Listen, if it wasn't because you were so good, I'd bring you both off because you're both having a stinker." But they had that free kick in him or a bit of magic in him, and especially with his shooting as well, Cox, and you know, especially with what he was struggling with as well with the mental health, you would have never have thought that with with Cox. Um, 
But as I said, you, you never know what people are going through behind closed doors from, from a Dex teammate point of view. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you, I certainly didn't see it because he was very much a, a main character in that change room. He was loud, and but it just shows you that you know you you never know what's high actually behind real people's um, views and how they're feeling. And and he's done brilliantly. I think he said he was sober the other day when he for twenty six three years was it twenty three months twenty six months something like that. It's got to be around yeah. about that. Yeah, that's brilliant, man. It's fair play to me because it is it is tough because. You know the the pressures you not the pressures you get, but the the situations you're involved in Christmas parties, uh, Christmas dues, and you know the temptations always there. So well, he's done well, and well done to him for doing that. Yeah, your relationship with uh, Dean Saunders, then you know, I mean, you had a very good relationship, with him and and uh, but what was you know what was he like to be around? And uh, is the story say you know he is a character himself? I know he was your gaffer for two yeah. clubs. But was, you know, the humour there and was he, you know, was that character of Dean Saunders there at the, the clubs that you yeah. put played on the floor, yeah? Yeah, 100%. Listen, don't get me wrong, I've always said it from day one. Like, because I think what happens is when when Dean signs me, I think the players feel threatened because I think they feel that like I'm going to tell him, you know, oh, he's going out drinking or he's doing this. Or, you know, I had it when I went to Crawley. Um, the, the lads went out in London on a Tuesday. But what they didn't realise is Dean's office was right next to where they were. Um, and the physio was going in telling him stuff, but it was too. So they had a night planned out on a Tuesday. Half hour later, we're in on the Wednesday. We're now off on the Thursday. So they all blame me. I was like, why would I kill your nights out for? I said, and now I can't go home. I, I've got a young family in Chester. And now I can't leave London to Chester. So why would I do that for? It makes no sense. I said, all I'm saying to you is, I've known Dean for a long time. I was like, just be careful what you're saying and who you're saying it around in terms of the staff because they will be going back to him. Mm. Um, but obviously I knew him more personally, so I could just have an argument with him or just speak as normal like we are now. And it, he just laughed, he just used to giggle. But his personality is, uh, it, 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 it's what engaged me to him is, you know, because when we played at Forest Green, we beat him 3 0. And his team talk was about me and my brother. And he was like, they've only got two good players. Uh, one's the brother, Michael, he's da 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 And he was like, Lee, he's a fat alcoholic, he's crap, he's this, he's rubbish. And my best mate, Mangy, was in the team and he's going, oh, Gaffer, he's like, he's a very good player, he's just, he's just a wrong one, it's just a can or whatever he says. And we won 3-0. And he ran, I rang him up, I said, oh, good, I'm not bad for a fat alcoholic. Yeah. And then he signed me after that. <laughs> um, but he, he rang me, he rang me and said, you need three things to play for me. You need ability, I said, easy, I'll be your best player you've ever signed. He said, you out fight someone. I said, yeah, that's fine, not a problem. But he said, you need to be fit. And I went, I'm going to have to stop you there, Dean. That's not me, mate. And he went, what? You can't say this to me. You, I'll give you one word of advice, sir. Never tell a manager you can't run. And he signed me the next day anyway. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I've, seen, I've got loads of rhythm. And, you know, he signed me at uh, Wrexham, signed me at Doncaster. And then he signed me at Crawley then from Nuneaton. Which was a masterstroke by him, really. Yeah, and do you know what? Of all the managers, you know, because fair play to you, you know, the clubs you've been to, you have been under, you've been playing for some of the, you know, biggest characters in football, as you say, or some of the, you know, I, I don't know about you know top manager, but let's say top characters in football, and the likes of Dean Saunders, Gordon Strachan, you know, Nigel Clough, you know, and he, I mean, you've had your fair share of um, playing under good, um, managers, you know, who've made a name for themselves, whether as a player or as a manager, you know, and um, and you've. Uh, <laughs> Um, the this, this story's telling me about Ketter in town, you know, the, the, the chairman and everything. Was there any, apart from the time of Ketter where someone's, you know, drawn a line, was there another moment where someone has, you know, crossed the line with you where you go, oh, hang on a minute, you know? Because from my sense of your character, you know, you're, you're the type of guy who goes, you, you, you don't care. Um, you don't tolerate, you know, um, what was it? Um, do you know what? I, I, I see what I'm saying and then I, it just goes completely out the window. I think the thing with me is I overcare, but I've got no toleration to bullshit. So mm. in terms of like, I care football, I love football to bits. So when someone starts encroaching on what I love and doing it wrong or doing it bad, or I, it got to a point when I was, the more older I got, the more experience I got and the more knowledgeable I got in terms of detail, because I was doing my badges. That's like, I've always had the, the, there was like a policy where like this, you cross that line. I don't care who you are. 
you ain't you ain't telling me this. You ain't you you can't speak to me this way. And like you know, so many players would just take it, and they're like, they'd say, oh, he's a bad egg, he's a bad egg. But then when they all the reporters and all the player staff and all the all the fans would speak to the players, they were like, oh, holy class, like he just he just didn't he just like just treat him fairly, and he'll treat you fairly. Like, like mm. listen, I understand hierarchy, you know, in any job. Um, I'm, I'm a manager now, so I treat my players with the utmost respect. But I'll tell you one thing: what I give to them is that raw honesty, and they love it because there's no bullshit. There's no bullshit there. It's like, listen, you haven't been good enough. This is the reason why you ain't playing. This is the reason why I need you to do better, and I need you to do this for you to be the best version of yourself. They can't say anything, but managers have got a habit of going, right, Lee. Um, I'm going to play you on the left today because I feel with your right foot, you can do this or do that. Or I'm going to rest you today. You looked a bit tired. Just tell me the truth. Like, don't, don't lie. And like, and this is why football's got a big stigma now around about like lads heads are gone. Like, because they just get lied to from the state, from your 15, 16, 17, you get turned and chewed out. And as I said, enough, you know, Gary Mills tried to do it at me at Wrexham. Um, I signed from Crawley. He made me captain at Wrexham. Um, I wasn't fit, but the, the preseason training, I, I know I didn't hate like running. I used to love the old regime where that fitness and that, that as I say, it's all in the bank, it's all in the bank. Um, and he tried to out me a few times in the paper. Now, I didn't say nothing about the drinking cultures, the lack of training. You know, we didn't train. You know, I used to train with the youth team every day. Like, um, when fans used to, because I just, I was probably the best player. Me and Anthony Wordsworth um, were the best players in League One at Crawley. So I had, I had a few teams who wanted to sign me in League One, turn them down, come back home, just live at home, be captain of Wrexham. And he was abusing me in the paper, um, which if you've got a problem, just pull me privately. Um, so anyway, he done it twice. And the third time, I, I, I pulled him, I ran in, I had a word of him and said, right, it's the last time you do this because if you're going to keep doing this when it's not true, then I'll, I'll dig you out about the drinking, the lack of training, the lack of discipline, the, the unprofessionalism that you bring into this football club. And then he played me every game. So I think I scored three of my first three games and set up 11 goals. I had nine man of the matches and every other fans were like, what's going on here but it proved him wrong and me right because I just kept my dignity didn't react on Twitter didn't didn't do anything publicly kept my pride and it backfired on him not me you know with the uh, the, the drinking culture I, I don't want to go into this under the cosh kind of motive because every time I watch under the cosh they always mention the drinking culture and I'm always thinking oh I don't know. you know always a bit have you got a good but I just thought I'd give it a bit of a twist here um have you got a uh, a good story around the drinking culture whatever club that you went to or anything like that. I'll tell you one, which was, which is funny because you've just had him on Curtis McDonald. Oh, okay. There we go. Yeah. So Curtis, so bear in mind when we joined Forest Green, you had me, Curtis McDonald, Kyde Mohammed, Darren Jones, who's in Newport. Who was the other one in the car? James Simpson. I don't know if you remember him. He was at Barry town and Cardiff city. Oh the yeah. Field. Yeah. Yeah. Vaguely, vaguely remember him. I think it was Jimbo. Anyway, long story short. Anyway, so um, we've gone to, uh, so we've gone, we picked the lads up in Kai's big set. We've gone, we've had to go on, on a team bonding exercise in Ross on Y or Hereford. It was a camping trip with um, canoeing, canoe, canoeing. So we quickly worked out, me and Darren Jones, that it was like a four hour canoe. But if you've done it properly, it's like two and a half hours. But we're allowed to have a drink straight after it. So I've turned up. I've got scuba diver gear on. Uh, all I do, I've never met these lads before. So I've got like goggles on. I've got the mask. I've got the full suit on. I've got the flip flops. And I've like I've barely mind. I've been at the club two days. So I've turned up. We've done it. Get back. Me and Daz are drinking. So we've had about eight cans before they, anyone else has finished. So. We start drinking, we play games as you do around the campfire and then like Jim Arby was like, right, lads, we're off um, we're off now into Hereford. So like sounds already. So we go out, have a few drinks. Um they one of the lads throw over you know like childish stuff what they done. So one of the lads and I'll, I'll go into the final bit when he says it. We didn't know this at the time. So they're throwing rubbish at each other. Then we get into the nightclub, then Jim Harvey, the manager starts a fight with this man 
for some reason. Jim Harvey's 57. He's got a bum bag on, shorts, white socks, uh, Jesus shoes. Ask Curtis about when he tells you. So what? Uh, Rigolosi, who's a scouser, he sorts it out, finishes it. So we, we're leaving the club about three o'clock. Me, Curtis, and my best mate now, Andrew Manger, they were still in the club. So <laughs> it is, it's a bad story. It's disgusting, really, in a way. But So anyway, we're messing around and... I won't say who, but somebody's had a shit on his car. So all, all down the wing screen, all down the, all down the, the um, all down the car, everywhere. And uh, so anyway, me, Kaid, Daz, and Curtis are sitting in the car crying, like physically crying. Mangy's come over. I, I, I don't know how he knew. He was like, "You shit on my car, haven't you?" But like we couldn't talk. Like we physically couldn't talk. So <laughs> it, it, it was. It was like. Like a cider one as well, so it was like all sloppy and that. It was horrible. Mate. Oh no! Oh me. So, <laughs> so yeah. So anyway, we're laughing now. We we so we sobered up. We drove home. So we've got a game on the Monday then. So this was on the Saturday night game on the Monday. So Jim Harvey's called the meeting. So he's gone right, lads. Um, great trip, but there's a few things I'm not happy with. Um, you know. Well done, uh, Adrian, for sticking up for me, having the fight with the man. Brilliant team spirit. Well done, mate. Absolutely brilliant. Um, he's gone. Who through the, you know, there's been a fine from the council because of the bins being thrown. Bit childish, so I let that one go. He said, uh, John Ardica and four of the other lads drove from Hereford to Preston drunk. And he went, I can't condone that. He said, but well done for getting the lads home safe. Uh, but I can't condone it. Twenty five quid each. Uh, <laughs> so this, this is what I was saying. So and now we're all in a, we're all in the change room now, uh, in a square. So your eye contact is always going to be with another player. And as he's, he's going, he's gone. And for the worst thing I've and he's Northern Irish in his accent. He's going. And the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. It's absolutely disgusting. I've never. What makes you do this? It, it, what makes it go through your head? It's absolute disgusting. And he's gone, Fowls, why did you shit on his car for? <laughs> so, and so I'm like, I'm now trying not to laugh, but because he's staring at me, I can see all the lads behind him laughing. And he's going, well, the worst thing is, you don't even think it's not funny. I went, well, Gaffer is kind of funny now, but said, because all the lads are laughing. He went, Ah, oh, this you owe him a new towel for wiping the car, and you owe two valets on his car. <laughs> oh, but that, that that season was funny, mate. That Forest Green team was funny, lad. We had a good oh, laugh. Fair, fair play. Do you know what? Next time I see Curtis, I'm going to I'm going to ask him. <laughs> well, that's why they left. Kurt, Curtis left because I, Curtis and my brother left because how I was treated. They yeah. went to um, they went to Newport on the same day. My brother and Curtis. Um, I went to Wrexham and then they 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 left. They were like, I'm I'm done now. But yeah, Curtis, mate, he'll be able to tell you some stories. Oh, and, uh, went to his. Have you been to his dad's pub? Uh, no, I've. Do you know what he mentioned his pub on the podcast? And um, and I and I was going to say to him, where is this pub? I'm I'm going. You know, when lockdown's over, I'm going. The vaults, isn't it? Is it, it, it the vaults is it the Canton Cross? Canton. Oh, it's the Canton Cross, is it? Hey, do you know the one opposite Tesco's? By the, by yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. Is it that yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That one. But I went to his house with his mum and his dad. So obviously, his dad just used to, we used to go there after every game. And uh, his sister was back home once, and I had all the knickers and brown like, over my clothes, like where. <laughs> and his mum was like, "What are you doing? Like, it's disgusting." <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, nah, he's good. I got, I got him a good time with Curtis. Now. Oh, fair, no, fair play. Um. Yeah, no, I, I I've been in the that pub a few times, and I think we um when Barry went to play Clifton Villa in in Cardiff, yeah, yeah. um I think my mate Leon, I think the Canton Cross uh, was the pub we went to. Yeah, yeah, it's the, the one pub. on the corner. Yeah, yeah, because um Leon said to me, "That's the pub where Cardiff fans go." I know we're not Cardiff fans, but that's the pub that lets us bounce and do whatever. We gotta go. Yeah, yeah. I went, oh, I didn't know where he's in fair play. We're bouncing that day. <laughs> fair play. Uh, yeah. can't, can't go wrong. But speaking of, because we, we mentioned uh, Welsh Premier League teams and everything, you went to go and play for TNS and you went to play for Kevin Druid. Um, well, even though there were short spells in the Welsh Premier League, but what was, what was that experience like for you to be playing in the Welsh League system? 
Um, it was a means to an end at one point. So the TNS, I left Kidderminster to go to uh, TNS, which is a proper, how they done things was, was a proper football, like they proper football, proper weights, uh, your, your diet, everything was perfect to that thing. But I just found the league boring. Like, I just find, even now I still find it boring. I just think, in fact, it's getting better now because Barry have come into it. Um, Ballard are sort of now, you know, there was a time where I thought Barry were going to win the league, but and now TNS have dropped off a little bit, but they're still the the, the better team, if that makes sense. Um, Gav Connors Key and the Jock, I love watching them because I think he's a good manager, and I think I think the rest of them are all like the same, like play the same, and they, they talk the same. They're all from the like low block, mid block, high press, and like football just for me at the minute, I. The way I manage and coach is very simple, simplicity. Like speak how we would speak in the pub to the players. Yeah. Like no one wants to hear low block, mid block. Just sit a bit deeper for me. Just play higher for me. Just stay in the middle of the park because ultimately we're getting all these buzzwords. And when I watch the Welsh Premier League, because I've been on the the, the education programs with the badges, like they just. It's like they're getting all these words of these like UEFA A's and pro license and going. Well, I can't wait to use these in my interviews. Just talk real about football. Just talk like, because the players will understand you a lot better than saying, rotate this and do that. And like, just calm down with the buzzwords, mate. But, um, and that's my thing with the Welsh Premier League is that it's similar to the sort of, you know, there's only three teams who can win it, four teams who can win it. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? So, like, what's the point in that? Yeah, no, I agree with you. Um, I mean, <laughs> don't worry, this is going for a Barry fan, but if I looked at it now, I think um, it, it would be amazing to see Barry win the title again, but I think it's a slow climbing step because where we've come from now, especially during the mid-2000s and the early 2010s, it is going to be that slow pro- progress. And, it, uh, and especially, even though, despite the fact we got some players like Curtis and David and, uh, and a few others, you know, it, it's still going to be that slow climb. And, um, and funny enough, I just had an interview earlier on with um, with uh, a friend of mine, and he the, the actual title uh, is called uh, "Why Is TNS Hated?" And I just went, "Well, I'll tell you for why." And uh, it just went, just completely blew up. But I know you played for TNS, but uh, yeah, but- it's a great club. But I say when I grew up, Barry was the team. Barry yeah. was the best team. Like they, they, I think New Saints they were called then were just coming through. But Barry, like I'm trying to think what his name. But Tony, remember Tony Bird? Tony Bird, I remember Tony Bird. There was um, Chris yeah. Pike. He, was... He, he, that was a team I used to watch. You know yeah. I mean? It was like, um, what was the lad do? Darren Ryan. Mm. Uh, who else was there? Gary was Barnett. The yeah, as I said, but they're the team I used to watch because it's, that's the team growing up. And it is going to have to be a long while, mix. And now, I think now Gap Koniski are the best team in the league. Um, don't get me wrong, you got to remember, Gav's, Gav, I love Gav Chesterfield. I think he's brilliant, the way he talks. Like, he, he done my, my licences with me and he, he talks. And you're just like, like he just, I don't know, I don't know if I somehow his voice, like, he just... This is all just, about his yeah. voice. You just, you just sink in. He's telling a story, even though he's not. And you just think, yeah. I need to listen to the, what this man is saying. Yeah, 100%. He says it. It's the way he talks. I don't know, he done it for me, mate, on the fight licences. All the rest of them, I was like, falling asleep. And then as soon as he talked, you're like, I want to hear more, like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. As a player, I could only imagine what a football player, like him coaching with that tone and that delivery, they'd just be like a sponge off him. And he's done brilliant, mate. This, like, you know, Newtown's good. I went to Kevin Druids, mate. I, to be honest with you, I signed for, I was, someone tweeted me last night from Carnarvon. I didn't play for 12 months. Um, and then Ewan Williams, who's the manager, was like, this, we've got 11 players. We've got playing real in the quarterfinals of the Welsh Cup. They beat us 5 0 the week before, two weeks before. Listen, just come and play. Well, mate, I haven't kicked the ball for 12 months. We won 3-2. I set up the winning goal. Um, and their fans are bonkers at Carnarvon. Like, they're bonkers fans, but great yeah. fans. Are, yeah. You know, I, I, I got nothing against Carnarvon fans. I know there was one or two issues that we, Barry fans, some of our guys had trouble in the past. Nothing too serious, but uh, every time we go there, even though they slate us, and I, I remember because we, we got a different drum now, but we had this little mini drum that did make a noise. And they were going, uh, what the fucking hell is that? You know, just at the little drum that we had. And yeah. one of uh, one of my mates uh, just was banging it. And then I gave it a go. And as soon as I smashed it, the, the stick just went smack. 
and the drum went all over the place. And all the Canal fans went, hey, like that. I saw fair play, you know, touche. I'll give them that, touche. <laughs> uh, they're good. Um, as I said, the first thing I, because I, I didn't know nothing about them, and they got promoted from the league below in the Cymru and they went up. But the first thing I remember, they were all men, like all Stone Island, all men between like 18 to 35 or 40, just game, like, you know what I mean? And I remember watching the one, they played TNS on the TV, if I remember, they beat them. And they broke the advertising boards. Yeah. I celebrated over it. Uh, yeah, Kevin Druidge was I, the Welsh league, mate. It was like it was my, it was quite funny, really, because I got rejected from Kevin Druids, Rill, Colwyn Bay, TNS. Who was the other Welsh club? Airbus. That was one other club, but I had a I had a medical. I had this. Um, it was something to do with my white and red blood cells. I couldn't move, and I just like I always carried weight, but I could always run and always dictate a game. But I just had nothing. In, I was so lethargic. I was like, I, I, so I, when I used to say I'm crap, I was like, yeah, you're right. Went to the doctor, took this pill to get my red blood cells back in line with my white to, to give me the energy back. And then I ended up signing for Nuneaton. From Nuneaton, I ended up signing in League One. I'm like being the best, one of the best players in League One. And then Chris Herbert, who was at Kevin Drewers at the time, who's now at Salford, he tried to sign me the summer after. I was like, you cheeky bastard. You didn't even play me at Kevin Drewers. So why am I going to come and play for you now at Ron Cold Linux? Um, but yeah, it was, it's just how mad football works. But yeah, it's a good league, mate. It's getting better. But, you know, I want everybody to have a level playing field. So if everybody's full time, if they all got 4G pitches or they all got grass pitches, um, you know, that, there's too many differences in terms of the budget. Like, TNS's budget will be at easily four or 500 grand. Mm. You know, Barry's budget, possibly 100 grand. Yeah especially, yeah, especially with the European competitions as well, because mainly the European money is just going towards the budget. So, cool. but that's just not probably not just Barry, that could be any you know club that are not on the yeah, levels with TNS. So, uh, yeah, well, you know, I, one of my mates, I won't say the name, but he signed for Bala for 500 quid a week. I he was in my office trying to sign for me, and we had the offer, and was like, Listen, mate, you're gonna have to sign that deal like 500 quid a week for one night a week. You've got to sign it, like, it's ridiculous, yeah. But, Bala, Bala, what do they get? Like 40 fans, a sheep and a cow. It's like, you know what I mean? It's 500 no, quid a week. Probably just 10 fans, 100 sheep, <laughs> and maybe five cows. I'll give them that. <laughs> like, don't get me wrong, I know they earn their money well and they're good people, Ruth and um, the other fella there, but this is what I'm saying like this. I, I don't get it, man. I don't. I yeah. Don't get but you know, I've uh, got a couple more questions for you. And again, uh, thanks for coming on, Lee, and just talking about, you know, your career and just some of the stories you know I, I've, had, I've had a blast you know fair play it's been really fun talking about it um the one thing I want to ask is that you were in in the final stages of your career before you went into management you were at Hollywell town uh, maybe you played in a cup tournament I don't know if it was a league or anything but um what made you go to Hollywell and then finish your career there what, what was the reason behind it it was do you know what I, I think I signed from twice but I never played a game from it was like what happened? Sorry, yeah, no, I didn't sign for them twice. So I finished, I actually finished at Telford. I, I everybody told me not to play for this team. Like the managers were like absolute shambolic. Like they didn't have a clue. Rob and Larry, they were called. Uh Chuckle Brothers. Like it, it was shocking me, honestly. And I I we just lost a baby, me and my missus, and he was ringing me. And I was like, listen, this is not the right time, mate. I said, I know what you're ringing for. Trust me, I know I wanted just as much as you like. I, would, I couldn't wait to tell him I didn't want to play for him and he couldn't wait to tell me. But I was like, listen, just give me the favour, give me 24 hours, like, we're at a really crucial time here when we miss it, blah, blah, blah. And he didn't do it. So I went, you know what, fucking keep the money, mate. I ain't ass. I ain't playing for you again. You don't know your arse from your elbow. I needed this time to be with her. He didn't give it to me. And that's why I'll never hold him with any respect because he couldn't give me the what. Never mind football, just a personal one-to-one. -one. So anyway, I thought, right, I need to get out of football. I need a job. I need to earn money. As a man, you've got to earn money to pay the bills. Otherwise, <laughs> you, 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 you're living on the street or back in mum and dad's. So I went and worked for Timson's. Um, great job, great company. Enjoyed it until their customers started abusing you. And you're like, hang on a minute. You're fucking, who are you talking to? But I'm not no, no longer Lee Fowler football player. Mm -hmm. I'm Lee Fowler, the Timson's man, who's who's not glued the shoes properly or your key doesn't work or your phones haven't been put down properly or I've messed up, do you know what I mean? And uh, so I was thinking, right, okay, no worries. Um, 
But then my mate texted me. I was playing Sunday league with my mates on a Sunday. Score the pub on a Saturday. Wake up on a Sunday. Still, still with a drink. And then you go and play on a Sunday. And oh, there's Lee Fowler there. And I'm gonna smash him. You know what I mean? And I didn't care. I just used to stand up front. If the next the ball come to me, I wouldn't move. So I just I mean I was still probably drunk and tired anyway. So um, and anyway, the Hollywood manager was watching the game and I scored for like the halfway line against some rubbish team. And it was when my name was still really sort of okay. Do you know what I mean? She was like, oh, mate, come and sign for us. I said, well, I can't play Saturdays. I'm working. I'm a manager now at Timson's. I can't get Saturdays off. I'll play the Tuesdays. I can't play Saturdays. Um, and then literally, I I couldn't play any Saturdays, mate. Otherwise, I would have played every game I could. And then I, then I went into the system manager and then then. So it sort of curtailed it anyway. So but I don't really miss it, mate. No, fair enough. I was going to ask you then because my last question was going to be, uh, how do you look back on your on your career as a footballer? A lot of um, enjoyment, pain, some regret, not all of it. Do you know what I mean? It's like because if if I wasn't what I was then, I wouldn't be who I am now. So regardless, if I would have if I would have changed my ways now, the problems would have come now. Do you know what I mean? So. If that makes sense to you, like I, I could have gone for all, I could have earned all this money, I could have played in the Premier League, the Championship, all my career, played for Wales, which I should have done for all my career. But then at the end of it, I would have been exactly like I was during it. So for me, it was, I had a one or two regrets that I shouldn't have done. Um, but, you know, not shouldn't have done, shouldn't have got caught, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I get what but, you mean. Yeah, and I, and I don't mean that in a sly way in terms of get caught. It's like, Certain things happen to me where it happened to every other person in, in our age group growing up. You get into trouble, you have a scrap, you have a straightener with someone, so I shake your hand, see you later. I get caught. You know, I get caught. I have a drink on a Thursday, which or Wednesday, I get caught. No one else does. Do you know what I mean? But that, that's the only thing I wish I didn't get caught because I still have to live my life. I need to live my life. As I said, if you don't live your life at that particular time, your life, it's like when you see men now, when they get to 60, they get divorced. First thing they do, buy a soft top with like a Porsche or a like mini convertible. They have a midlife crisis because they didn't get to do it in their prime. Yeah. So I've done everything I needed to do from 15 to 27, partying, the women, the drink, drug, whatever you need to do, I've done it. So when I got to this stage of my career, I'm ready to, I'm like the most chilled out person now. Unless someone says something about my family, I don't care. Like, I don't, I don't care. Like that. I've done it. I've done whatever I need to do, I've done. Um, and now I've got a chance as a manager to restart again and do things right for the players who were playing under me, which I didn't have. So, do you know what? Fair play, Lee. Do you know what? It's one of the top podcasts I've actually done made my night. Uh, I'm not saying I had to blow smoke up your ass or anything. You've actually made my night. Fair play to you. Um, I was going to say just uh, thank you so much for coming on the Dragons uh, Voice podcast. And I'd love to have you again on the show because it was absolutely fantastic. And I'll let Curtis know about that. <laughs> give, give, him a, uh, give him a text after this to say, I've just had fouls on, little fouls on. Yeah. Uh, but as I said, mate, I've done, I've done a few now. I've done them with, um, I've done Under the Kosh. I've done uh, the one with Gareth Seddon and Jahumi. I've done one with Wrexham as well. But as I say, mate, just tell the truth. And most people who do this sort of stuff just blag it like, oh, they, they try and, they try and impress people or yourselves to make it better. And it gets worse. So it's like, I always say, you ask me an honest question, you're going to get an honest answer back. If you don't want that answer, don't ask the question. Like, and yeah. that's, that's my motto. Like, if you, do you know what I mean? If you ask me a question, I'm going to tell you the truth. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's what, and that's, that's why I've got a good report with, you know, like with like the media type of people, um, because they know they're going to get, listen, I'm not daft. I'm articulate. I understand questions. And I understand how it comes across. Yeah. But, I can only be myself when I do it. I can't be like any other way. You can't be like uh, you can't be a persona because otherwise, you know, you, you're not going to get the best out of yourself rather than the best out of the yeah. people watching it. My personality is what's got me through. Do you know what I mean? So, and that's what's going to get me through as manager as well. So, I can't. I, I, it's not. <laughs> I might have been the same way since I was five. I was I was walking off pitches at five years of age because like Bristol City, Blackburn, people wouldn't give me the ball, I'd just walk off and say, sound, I'm going. So, you know, yeah, my, my nan and bam, so we'd get, we went to Blackburn when I was 13 and uh, they tried to sign my brother from Palace to Preston to make me sign for Blackburn. 
So everything was agreed that my brother was buzzing, like signing Preston in the championship. Blackburn was signing in, um, but they were signing me really, and uh, they wouldn't pass me the ball in the warm up. So I just walked off. Bear in mind, we were on a, it took us seven hours to get from Cardiff to Blackburn, Cardiff to Manchester, Manchester Blackburn, Blackburn to Preston, and uh, my mum was like, "Lee, what are you doing?" I was like, I "Didn't give me the ball. I just walk off." And they actually offered me a seven-year deal, and oh. the money was ridiculous. <laughs> Honest God, mate, it was like I walked off after two minutes. She was like, My granddad was like, Well done. He's had a few whiskeys you know, on, the, on the way up the train. And um, he was like, Well done, boy. Stick in for, you, stick for yourself. My mum was raging, like, like, You little bastard. You're, you're grounded. <laughs> yeah, no, do you know what? I'm going to have you on again. That was a top quality podcast. And like I said, I got to thank you again for coming on and just talking about events and football. So thank you very much. Yeah, cheers, man. That's right, mate. Anyway, so guys, that was uh, me follow on the Dragon's Voice podcast. And make sure you like, share, subscribe to the channel and keep supporting. And don't worry, there'll be more to come. And I'll definitely have a league again. Because that was fun. Uh, so anyway, thank you so much for supporting, guys. And I'll see you all next time. Take care.